Hello, everybody, and welcome uh, to Volume 5 of Bluebeard Pride. Uh, I am very excited to be here. A uh, big thank you to Katie for doing production and uh, helping run this thing uh, and for hosting us over here. Um, yeah, so uh, before we dive in, let's go around and meet our lovely players today, see who they are, who they're playing, uh, pronouns for themselves. Uh, and uh, let's start off with uh, Alicia. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I'm Alicia. My pronouns are she or they. Uh, I'm playing the witch today, which is very exciting. Um, I play objectively way too many RPGs, uh, but I'm really excited to fit this one in. You know what? That's that's a big mood. <laughs> a big old mood but uh you know what always try to fit in good good games it's always i will always make room for feminist rpgs that's for sure awesome <laughs> and uh next up let's go over to jess hello oh uh, hi i'm jess um go underscore gg on twitter and twitch i am playing the mother today i'm ready to be a good and proper mama um, I'm very excited about this game, so thanks for having me on. Oh, pronouns are she, her. Awesome. And uh, last but not least, we have Kelly. Hi, I'm Kelly, a Kelly on Twitter. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and uh, I will be playing the Animus today. Um, and yes, all of the echoes about all of the excitement and the been waiting for this for a long time. <laughs> awesome. Yay. And uh, I am, like I said, I am Kiana. Uh, I go by she, her, and I am the groundskeeper. Um, I am everything in this game, but it's not the bride and the sisters. I range from the NPCs to the house itself, and uh, I'm very excited to do this new installment of a tale of feminine horror. Uh, before we get started, um, I just want to say uh, this is a dark and heavy game. This delves into some uh, topics uh, that may be considered sensitive uh, for anybody. So please, if you need to take a break, um, we always want to make sure that your well-being is placed first. Um, and that goes for both my players and for the audience who is watching. Uh, but thank you for joining us as we uh, dive in. Um, yes, yeah, so um, we should start off today with a story to set the scene. And let's, because there's always a story to be told here. Once upon a time, there lived a Lord whose palace was so splendid and so richly furnished that even the Sultans could not be compared with it. He had dishes of gold and silver, sofas and chairs upholstered in the finest silk, the walls were adorned with every kind of curious antique. There was, however, something very odd about this lord. The color of his beard was a rich and shocking blue. His countenance was both distinct and unmistakable, and so he was never spoken of by his real title, which was grand and noble, but instead he was simply referred to as Bluebeard. He was a fearsome man with deep-set eyes, and he was known for having an uneven temper. Even so, Bluebeard had been married many times. No one quite knew what had become of each of his wives in turn, as there had never been a funeral at the palace that anyone living could remember. They simply vanished, and when time passed, he would marry anew. One day, Bluebeard went hunting in the countryside near his estate. With a sun high, he came upon a dilapidated farmstead and wished to slake his thirst. The farmers were eager to please the powerful lord and sent their lovely young daughter scurrying to serve him tea and bread. Be Bluebeard was instantly smitten with her beauty. He decided right then that he would take her as his wife. For a week he entertained her amongst a cadre of other fine lord and ladies. No expense was spared. His wealth was dazzling in a way a cobra dazzles a mouse. After that single hedonistic week, Bluebeard came to call with a marriage proposal. Bluebeard scared the young woman, but she couldn't let her family languish in poverty. And besides, maybe his beard wasn't quite that blue. 
she accepted his proposal. In short order, they were married and at the palace, and such a sight it was. A thousand white lilies decorated the pagoda for the ceremony. Delightful incense burned throughout the night. And the young bride awoke the next morning in her bed alone, her marriage yet unconsummated. And as she wakes up, let's meet our bride. So our players here are all playing different aspects of the bride called sisters. And each of the sisters represents a fragment of the bride's psyche, a part of her body. They all come together to form the singular person, but each of them have their own wants and desires and a sense of self. So let's, um, let's go over, what, let's meet our bride and go over what she looks like. So Animus, what are the bride's hands like? I think they are, they're very delicate. They're like uh, piano hands, right? Long fingers, uh, long, thin, delicate fingers, and they're very soft. So like she, you can tell she has no calluses. There's no labor that she's done. Um, And what weakness do you give away when others hold your hands? Um, I think it's easy to read how she's feeling. Um, whether that's through that connection that you have in those kind of like hand holding more intimate moments, or if it's through literally like the palm sweating and the shaking between the two of them, you can tell how she's feeling. All right. And mother, what is the bride's figure like? Um, I think she has those delicate hands, but she also has maybe the form of a dancer. And maybe that's how she sh sort of, um, maybe she has those soft piano hands cause she was sort of musical, sort of artistic. And um, yeah, so she has sort of like a slim, somewhat athletic body. And what do others wish was different about it? Um, I think maybe, maybe even that little bit of athleticism was like too much. They're like, no, no, girls don't, girls aren't strong. They don't like <laughs> have muscles. You have to be more frail. <laughs> and which... What is the bride's hair like? The bride's hair is a big, messy mop of curls. Uh, it's not even like one, it's not the kind of like well-tailored curls. It's, it's like multiple curl patterns. It's just like a mess and it's going all in, in various directions. And it's um, not black, but dark, dark brown, a little frizzy. And how do others like you to wear it? Uh, pulled back tightly to contain the mess in a, in a low bun uh, at the nape of the neck, I think. Now we have an idea of what our bride looks like and how each of her sisters connect with them. But now we must understand a little bit more about the bride herself and how she came to Bluebeard's home. So, Animus, what are you leaving behind from your provincial life to become Bluebeard's bride? Um, 
I think going off of what the mother said, I think she, um, I think the bride probably was like an active dancer and she's leaving behind kind of those opportunities and like that career path to be like a ballerina um, to get married instead. And a mother? Uh, behind. I think the, the same idea. I think she sort of felt a bit of like pride in what she did and a bit of accomplishment. And now she gets to just be someone's other half. And a witch. I think we're leaving behind friends. Uh, we had a, a, a rich life. Um, of people surrounding us and so we're, we're leaving that behind to more of a lonely life and animus when you first met what loving gesture did bluebeard make that won you over um I think it was it was something um, really really simple. Like he noticed that maybe she was too warm and brought her a glass of water. And mother, um, I think he came riding up on a beautiful horse and he like tied it up and was gentle to it, and the horse didn't seem put off by him so we thought well animals know bad people so maybe he can't be too bad and which uh similarly to the mother um we got to have something in common for once the mother and the witch and uh he helped care for um a sick goat uh, that we cared a lot for and we were trying to save and he helped he helped show it love and care and nurse it back to health. Hey, nice. And Animus, what gift did you present to Bluebeard before the wedding and why did you choose this? Um, I think she gave him a, this is to Bluebeard, right? Yep. I think she gave him a very, um, delicate, like, pocket watch, um, a, that was, like, engraved, um, and I, he, she gave it to him because when they first met, um, his wasn't, uh, she had asked for the time and his wasn't working. And so she bought him a new one. And mother? Uh, I think to show our capability, we baked him something or cooked him something and thought ourselves like very proud only to realize he probably has like a gajillion chefs and stuff like that and doesn't need us to do that. And which? Um, I think that to um, keep a sort of connection with the land and the place that we came from, we gave him a whistle that we carved from an old dead tree near our home. Very nice. All right. And finally, to understand our bride there's one more question about the bride herself. Animus, do you trust your generous husband, Bluebeard, or do you hold unkind suspicions? And why? I 
I think I trust him because he hasn't shown me any reason not to, but also because any of the stories or rumors about previous spouses maybe haven't reached me because I've been so busy focusing on dance. Um, so it's a more solitary, like focused existence. It's I'm not, when I left behind friends and people that were important to me, um, I'm not as much of like a social butterfly that would be involved in the gossip. And mother? Um, I think the mother wants to trust him as she wants, uh, you know, an ideal marriage situation, but she does definitely have, like she's telling herself she cl trusts him implicitly, but in the back of her mind, she has those nagging voices. <laughs> and which? Uh, I think those nagging voices are the witch. Um, she doesn't trust him. Um, she, uh, she can't trust someone so disconnected. Um, from the earth and from people and so like tapped into this opulent lifestyle. And now we understand our bride and what she has, what life she had had and what life she leaves behind to become Bluebeard's bride. But now we must understand the sisters themselves because like all family, sisters must get along must work together sometimes but it doesn't mean they always like each other sisters bicker and argue and have contradicting motivations so animus with your sisterly bonds you hold yourself apart from your sisters but one of them is the only one who sues you and explain a the time they calmed your rage Um, the, I find the mother to be soothing because there have been times where I have gotten somewhat confused. Uh, I think I'm think very straightforward about things, and so if when there's there was a time when um, I was in a social situation where someone didn't say what they meant, and I got very frustrated by that and confused and with myself and kind of angry about not being able to understand and the mother was able to kind of talk me through both sides of things and kind of explain why that person may not have been straightforward um, and why that's okay. Um, and just talk through those feelings. And while one sister is the only one who sues you, you're envious of the other. Explain why you can never compare to them. Um, so the other is the witch here, I think. And she is just uh, emotionally stronger than I am. She's very clear of mind. Um, and purpose in a way that, and decisive in a way that I just don't think I can be. Lovely. And mother, 
You know best and try to guide your wayward sisters, but one of them irritates you with an obstinance. Explain a time they undermined your authority. I think the witch is very independent <laughs> and very strong willed. Um, and so while, you know, the mother, like you said, is trying to always do mother's knows best, like, oh no, we have to like, um, the witch is most likely to <sighs> act out in a non typical way, in particular, like, you know what I mean? Whereas we might have been like, oh, we need to get married as soon as possible. We need to have children as soon as possible. The witch is all like, nah. <laughs> awesome. And while one of them irritates you with their obstinance, you trust the other to have your back. Explain a time they supported you in a time of need. Uh, I think the... The mother trusts the animus to have their back because while they sometimes sort of, uh, you know, embody rage and anger, it is, it can be a little bit more directed and pointed when we need it. It can be, it can help to uh, enact change we need to see. And so I think the mother trusts the animus or like to at least, like she sort of said, sort of talk through problems and then choose the right route and direct that anger in the right way. All right. And which your sisters are not nearly as important as power, but one of them is a useful tool. Explain how they helped your pursuit of blasphemous craft. Uh, I think the animus is a useful tool. Um, she bends to my will, uh, relatively easily, uh, so I can convince her to do things. Uh, sometimes it, I can get her on my side and we can sort of gang up against mother to achieve my goals. Yes. Yeah. And while one of them is a useful tool... Another draws an evil to her. Explain what you have done to keep that evil at bay. Oh man, mother just really wants a man and uh, men are the devil. So I do everything in my power uh, to um, act out in ways that keep them away. That's so good. <laughs> oh, it's really interesting to just have three characters in this game <laughs> because there's, there's some pretty interestingly tangled uh, bonds and I'm very excited. You know what? We now understand not just our bride, but the sisters that make up her that if embody the different parts of her mind and her body and now that we know we can begin our story our bride has woken up by herself in her bedroom her new bedroom alone told by a note that bluebeard had gone off for a sudden business trip to another neighboring county and will not be returning for two weeks a ring of keys has been set aside for the bride. And the only note is that you can explore any room in the house that is your house as well now. However, the only thing you cannot do is take that one small little key and enter that one room. Otherwise, everything else is yours to explore. And so I am going to roll to see which of our sisters has the ring, aka they're the ones that are at the forefront of the bride, the ones who are, while each of them have a say, the, bride, the sister with the ring is the one that has the most control over the bride at any, at any given point. So let's just see, uh, Animus will be one, uh, Mother will be two, and Witch will be three. 
witch, you are the one with the ring. Oh, I have the ring. You have the ring. Mm. And as you step out of your new bedroom into the halls, dark stone and plush blue carpeting with torches that light the way and paintings that line the walls. Describe to me the key that fits the first room you enter into. Um, the key is very long, um, much longer than any of the other keys. Um, it feels fragile, um, like too much pressure could break it. Uh, and it is very simple to look at at a glance, but uh, if you take more time, there are very delicate um, floral engravings inset all along it. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. So as you search through the halls to find the door that this key fits into, you find it as it almost beckons to you. And as you insert the key, and unlock the door, opening it. You enter into the room. You find yourself in what appears to be a fencing room. Um, you see um, moonlight creeping through that glass ceiling um, that, um, now the only source of light here can smell the of dust and fabric that's starting to decay from time and disuse as your steps echo off the stone walls. Across from the door is a row of heavy wooden chairs upholstered with this faded blue velvet and shackled with chains. Central chair decorated with delicate carvings, that same kind of floral carvings. And to one side of the room, a row of vapiers glints in the moonlight. And another wall hangs a portrait of Bluebeard with a woman and a young boy, flanked by battered training dummies. And as we enter into this room, Sisters, any of you may enact upon what are called the maiden moves. Uh, these are things like, I would like to investigate a mysterious object. I would like to take stock of the situation. Um, at any point, you may just ask to call upon those moves and um, you can ask me two questions from those lists. Uh, you may also care for somebody if there's somebody there that you know, that is grieving. And then the sister with the ring, you have the ring moves. You were able to do more things. And also you are the one who is able to exit out of this room. Um, while any of you can enact upon these moves, this, um, a reminder that you all are in one body. <laughs> so whatever happens to the body happens to all of you. So would any of you like to look at a particular thing, uh, investigate an object, or just take a look around and see what's here. I think uh, the animus would immediately go to the portrait on the wall. Okay. Um, and so I ask two questions. Uh, Yes, if, uh, you, if you would like to investigate a mysterious object, you may ask me two questions from the um, list. <laughs> so what memories does this item hold? So as you look up upon this portrait, uh, again, it's, it's of Bluebeard, his countenance unmistakable, um, standing with a woman and a young boy um, and this um, 
woman is clearly of a a very uh, high class. You would imagine the way that they're positioned, um, that they are husband and wife. Um, This painting is clearly done by a master. The strokes are um, impeccable and manages to capture this moment, a family portrait, uh, a father, a mother, and their son standing together in this room, uh, surrounded by training dummies, which is an odd prop, you would think. Uh, so yes, there's the tells of hours of time of this portrait being created. And then why did Bluebeard keep this item? It is a family portrait. Um, And clearly there is some sentiment to it of a family that he had or has. Would any other sister like to investigate this portrait or move to something else? I am captivated by the chairs. You said they're chained together? Um, Yes. So you look at the uh, chairs. They are shackled with chains. They um, They have chains that are on the uh, arms and the legs of them. uh, As if, you know, with manacles at the ends of them. That makes me very nervous. Uh, Can I take stock? Yes, you may. All right. Um, What traps have been laid for us here? Um, As you... Look, um, you, uh, the sister who is attuned to that, it is, that is not natural. Um, you look upon and you, and you note that the shackles seem enticing as of asking you to sit. Mm. And you would imagine that as you sat in those, they would traps you in them. Uh, sisters, maybe don't sit in the chair. Just a thought. And sisters, you may talk to each other uh, in character. That is a thing as way our own minds work, different parts of ourselves working through a problem. I think you wouldn't get like any words from the animus to that, but there would just be like a clear, like, okay. Um, I think since we're now wandering around this whole room and we've looked at the picture, we've looked at the chairs, I think the mother actually wants to go over and look at the foils because she's thinking of fencing and she's remembering how much we liked dancing and she's thinking of them as similar. Um, okay. I think what what memory do these items hold? So you look at them a little more closely, these uh, foils, and each of them have a unique hilt. Um, all of them have common elements across, but um, they are decorated, you know, with those delicate engravings. So flowers that you have noticed on the key and in different parts of this room. Um, But you also note uh, that each of them, while clearly used, um, you can see some bits and pieces of wear on them. They are not, uh, they are very well kept. So this tells of hours of practice with them. 
And as you kind of turn them to look, um, you spot that they are, each of the engravings, uh, engravings include uh, lovely women's faces on them. Each expression sorrowful with even delicate um, detail to the metal tears upon their cheeks. Does that also then answer what is odd or uncanny about these? <laughs> I mean, yes. Uh, but also as you kind of examine it, you kind of lift it up into your hands and go all, kind of almost run your finger along the the way you, your fingers actually touch a little too, and you realize that this is sharper than a foil should be. And as you prick your fingers on that a small drop of blood forms on your fingertip. Um, oh, I wanted to like play with that, but now that I'm bleeding, I feel like the mother would put it back because <laughs> mother doesn't want us to get hurt. So I think she would start to go to put it back unless one of the other sisters wants to play with the foils. <laughs> Yeah, so I guess, um, yep, she just puts it back on the rack. <laughs> and as you do that, and you go to like wipe away that little drop of blood that's now uh, from your finger, you wipe it away, it just starts to pool again. You do that again. And it doesn't seem to be healing. Oh, that's not... That's not good. Uh, oh, can we taste it? I was literally debating saying that. I was literally like, I think the mother puts it in her mouth. <laughs> yeah, so almost instinct uh, instinctively, when you try to you know deal with small cuts, you put it in your mouth, um, and you know what blood tastes like. This kind of that sharp, coppery taste. Um, but even again, as you kind of like wait for it to stop bleeding, it should just be a pinprick. Not healing. Um, sisters, uh, I suppose we should go find something to bind this. What do you, what do you think? It's definitely unnatural. Do you think binding will help it? I, that's all I can think to do. Do you have any other unusual uh, suggestions? Hmm, maybe some kind of salve of herbs and plants. Well, this, this room does have a lot of markings of plants. Do you think there's anything in here? We should look closer. I mean, you'd think if they were going to keep sharp objects in here like that, they would like keep things to take care of them too. Like th this can't be the first time this has happened. That's very true. Let's see. Let's look around the room and see if there's anything else. Okay. Um, yeah, you um, you walk around. Um, there seems to be no medical kit laid out to help, uh, but you do know that the chairs have arm have fabric upholstery. Um, you could likely use if you didn't want to rip your very nice dress that was a gift from your loving husband. Oh yeah, I ripped some fabric from the chair for sure. But then I just kind of stand there until mother tells me what to do with it because I don't <laughs> really know. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll take the rip fabric and try and like, because it's a finger, I don't want to accidentally make a tourniquet and then <laughs> harm myself further. So I'm trying to adequately put pressure on this while not losing the rest of my finger. <laughs> yeah, so you've had practice with this before. Uh, this is not something new to you. So you just, you were able to bind your finger. Uh, but um, even then, you kind of see 
that blooming spot of red. This is creepy. I was going to say this is deeply unsettling and we should definitely. I... I'm not sure what else there is. I wonder if we should. Um... Maybe we should go find somebody. <laughs> We could, we could call for help. Oh, no. Uh, I can call for help, I think, right? Yeah, yeah that, I think that, that is a big move. All right. Yeah, I mean, we won't stop bleeding. That's weird. So probably we should try to get some help. Okay. All right. Uh, well, so I will call out for help. Yep, so roll for that. Da, da, da. Resilience. I have none of that. Okay. <laughs> a seven. seven. That's that's still a, a mixed success. So with uh, a seven, I should call for help. Um okay. Um as uh, you call out for help, um the door opens and a a man dressed in a uh, or you imagine a man it's hard to tell dressed in a a fencing suit uh, with a, a mask that covers uh, their uh, their face will stride in uh, one of these uh, rapiers also kind of tucked into uh, their hip as they stride in. Um, and they will step and um, approach you, kind of give you a small incline uh, of their head, and um, says, um, Hum, may I help you, my lady? I like psychically raise an eyebrow at Mother and Animus because I should probably not deal with this. <sighs> Very sorry to bother you. Thank you for coming in immediately. We uh, we seem to have touched one of your foils, which seem to be a little unsafe, I must say. Um, and we seem to have harmed ourselves. And you know, simply wrapping it. I mean, you can see for yourself, it's it's coming right through the bandage. It's it's not stopping at all. We were wondering if perhaps, uh, do you have some salve particular to this? Is this a normal fencing thing, would you say? Can, I don't know. Can I say basically like the animus like holds out the hand like very like straightforward like <laughs> like a little kid to their mom, right? Like fix it. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, you can totally do that. Um, as uh, as you do that, he'll uh, take your uh, take your hand, um, as if to you know examine it, and uh, says, um, as you know, kind of turning your hand in his uh, grasp, um, and. Says, um, I do keep the uh, swords quite sharp. This is the way to best practice. Why would a lady like yourself be prying around with swords? And because you rolled a seven to nine, you make success. Um, you need to uh, first prove your loyalty to Bluebeard as starting to question why would a f fine lady of the house want to experiment with weaponry I, um yeah. so uh i i jump in here and uh probably much to the chagrin of my sisters and um it's a little bit of a pointed thing where i'm just like oh i just couldn't resist the dangerous weapons it's just they're so shiny 
I just, I just couldn't help myself. I mean, you know, you know, you know what it's like. I'm, I'm sure just can't help myself as a woman. And I have a creepy smile. I think you can feel the like grumpiness coming off of the animus. <laughs> like this very like I'm gonna poke you again with one of those things. <laughs> I think the mother is just shaking her head. <laughs> like uh... Um the f- uh the uh The fencer, uh, the fencer um, at the point who's still holding onto your wrist, um, just uh, inclines their head that still, you know, is hidden by uh, the mask that is the uh, protective cover. If you're so interested in this type of thing. Perhaps instead of just investigating, he'll pull out his rapier and place it into the hand that he still has in his grasp. And almost as if guiding you, uh, will kind of almost place your, himself behind you, holding against, oh, shifting so that you are holding on to the rapier and he's kind of behind you, guiding your movement. Um, says, perhaps I can teach you how to handle such things. Help! <laughs> I don't think I got this, sisters. I don't. I don't think I got this. Uh, your sassy mouth got us into this situation. <laughs> Maybe you want to try and get out. <laughs> <laughs> I think the animals would just be like, just tell him we need to fix our finger first. Like, what is this? What is he doing? <laughs> like, it, I'm bleeding. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to um, pull away as demurely as the witch can sort of uh, muster up, as opposed to like a disgusted push, but a demure push. Um, and say, I, I, I don't, I don't think that uh, Blue, Bluebeard would approve of that. Um, at that point, um, which do you kind of feel that? What does it feel like when you can sense that there's magic afoot? Like, what is? How does that feel to you? I think it feels like um, there's like a tingling of power that we don't get to feel very often in this world um, that I just, I kind of like want to latch onto. Um, so there's like a, like a warm burning inside. And so you feel that within you. And as you, and you feel it as if behind you. And as you turn, you see um, bluish smoke that you hadn't noticed before in this room start to swirl upon the ground. And as you from the smoke, you see two ghostly figures rising from the ground. One, a large, shadowy, bony humanoid. You're not even sure. Your mind trying to piece it together, figure that towers over a young boy. Young boy that looks very similar to the one in the painting. And the two of them are facing each other with rapiers in hand. 
And the boy looks over with a very loving smile towards you. And almost, you see him whisper, um, or almost mouth, uh, watch me, mother. And you see this, um, these two figures begin a duel with these practice rapiers. Sharp points uh, made safe with, you know, those kind of dull uh, points at the end. And you're watching this starting to happen. What is that? It, it feels like a memory. I think the mother is enraptured and wants to like see this play out now. And she's completely forgotten. I, I, like, I don't know if she even knows if we're still held up or what's happening, but this thing is happening now. And it's so different. And also she got called mother. And, <laughs> and so, I don't know. I think she just wants to see this play out. And so as you're watching this, this duel, um, quite quick um, between the two of them, the young boy, who's maybe around 10 years old, um, fast on his foot. Uh, clearly practiced um, and by sheer luck the boy seems to score a hit on this bony creature's shoulder and the sounds of clashing metal seize and there's a silence in this room before the creature breaks its rapier against its thigh and grabs the boy by the neck and as the boy looks over to you, out of to mouth, help me. This creature plunges the now sharp end into its heart. Can we like, I think the mother lunges over to like help. <laughs> like, You do have a rapier in hand right now. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I guess. Can I don't know. I wasn't even thinking with the rapier. I was just thinking like a dive into help, but I guess I guess so. Can we like lunge forward both like not even knowing how to hold a rapier, but just so intent on whatever we can do in this situation? Yeah. Um, you can lunge forward uh, just trying to reach um, however, uh, yeah, as you try to go for, um, this, this boy who had just been stabbed through with a rapier for this creature that its face looks now that you see it fully, looks a lot like, perhaps for a moment, like Bluebeard's. And uh, what are you doing? <laughs> um, because which is the only one who can do any violence, anything directly with his horror? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm feeling the rage of my sisters. And uh, if that's where we're leaning, I, I would dirty myself with violence. Okay. Uh, so you can roll that. And you almost feel like the animus is like cheering you on. Like, yeah. <laughs> Five. Uh, you lunge uh, for this, uh, trying to stab through this creature. And as you do, um, Yours, the, the rapier just seems to almost pass through this figure and yet it's able to as your your arm kind of sinks into um, this shadows and you can brush up against the bones that make up this thing 
it grabs hold of you. Still one hand around the now uh, lifeless body of this boy. And it starts to lift you up as well. Oh boy. Um... And uh, as it does, you um, see that face that again for a moment looks like Bluebeard's uh, as it says, Why did you let your son do this in the first place? Mother knows best, doesn't she? <laughs> um sorry so <laughs> the ghostly the ghostly not bluebeard um is there saying these horrible things but is the physical suited dude still here mm. oh yeah physical uh so yeah the, the fencer is still here <laughs> Where, what is he doing at all this? <laughs> He's just watching. <laughs> at this point. Uh, actually, he'll... Um, he'll... Uh, uh, he'll kind of call out... Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, can I use... Am I allowed to use a face move or do I have to have the ring to do it? Oh, no, you can use your face move at any point. You just have to say, I'd like to use my face move. Okay, I want to use my face move, the Kingmaker. <laughs> okay. And- and I want to call to him and and say, you, you, you said you wanted to teach me. Here is a true enemy. I believe in you. Defeat this foe, please. <laughs> did you see what he did to that poor child? And I'm I'm using my kingmaker move. Oh, and oh, I have to give him a gift. Please do this for me, and I will. Uh, take one of your foil lessons. Yep, that's the gift I foil offer. Foil lessons. Oh uh, yeah. Ooh, I didn't even mean that. For <laughs> sure. Okay. okay. Uh, I don't. I don't even know. Okay. If that's how that works. Yeah, that that's basically how it works. Yeah, it just says in system male servant or horror. Like, tell them you believe they deserve more power, give them a gift, and they're your champion. So I'm basically calling on this dude to be, like, my champion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. He will, um... She does just offer to smooch him. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. Yeah, I mean, I mean, as the witch put it, I guess I did in a euphemistic way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the witch is just pointing out it's clear what he wants. <laughs> uh, yeah. One, one smooch, one smacker for, for his, fighting this ghost for us. Um, and you see uh, the uh, the fencing master bow, <laughs> and he will turn and take up one of the rapiers from uh, the. Um, from the rack will stride forward and will start to uh, duel uh, this creature uh, which will drop you as well as the corpse of the boy as they start to duel it out Clanging of metal now fills this, this stone room once more. Um, I feel like I've seen enough here. Mm-hmm. I would like to propose a truth about this room. Okay. So, um, propose a truth. Uh, tell me what you think happened in this room. Uh, and take a token of faithfulness or disloyalty i think that um this room well obviously this was a fencing room i think that um 
accidents happened here and that maybe someone was injured, but not killed. Like, I think that this is like um, uh, an exaggerated memory, sort of magic is making it seem worse than it, than it is. And that uh, maybe there's just some guilt in this room. We had like the, the pin prick thing, a little bit of blood, someone got cut. Um, but I really don't think anything that bad happened here, actually. Um, and so I would take a token of faithfulness. All right. Bluebeard would clearly not at fault. Whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Boys will be boys. And what token do you take? Uh, faithfulness. Uh, and what physical token do you take? Oh, what physical that? token do I take? Um, Hmm. I don't know. What should we take? We already have part of the chair. I was gonna say we. That's have true. I was chair. I was thinking some fabric from the chair. So unless there's something else you wanted to pull, like unless you wanted to grab a sword on your way out the door or something. Can we? Yeah, let's take a sword. Yeah, we're gonna take a sword. Just I like running it. Running around the house with a sword now. We're the best. You know what? We're gonna tuck it though. I imagine that like what we're wearing is kind of very flowy and stuff as we're moving through the house. So we're we're gonna tuck the sword, you know, into our our dress <laughs> hidden in there somewhere. Take the sword as a token of faithfulness. And as you exit out of the room, you are once again in the halls which you can propose another key or you can pass on the ring to another one of your sisters. Uh, I would like to pass the ring. And who would you like to give it to? I would like to give it to Animus. Um, so which you are now immune to trauma um, until uh, the Animus passes on the ring. Sorry, I just had like a massive sneeze. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, Animus, describe to me the key to the next room. Um, I think the Animus, uh, was already like a little shook up there was like a lot of things that just happened <laughs> um and so she will will look at a key that's probably very different from the other the one that we just experienced so it's probably like a like a big brass key it's really like thick and simple um but it's like probably one of the largest keys on that key ring Okay. Hmm. Okay. So as you wander through the halls trying to find uh, where this leads to, and you find yourself, hmm. Where do we find ourselves? I'm trying to think of a room here. Mm. Oh, I know. I think you find yourself um, in front of a large door made of cogs and other interlock mechanisms. And as this room beckons to you and you enter, the door closes behind you. And you find yourself in a machine shop. Uh, no windows or other doors, just this one. Um, entirely lit by a system of clockwork and pipes. Your The smell is of iron and dust once more. Uh, especially as your steps disturb that layer of dust that covers the floor. 
uh, tables on both sides of the room are populated by strange mechanisms and contraptions. Uh, and among them, you see what appears to be a child made out of porcelain and clockwork. Another is a number of dirty glasses containing liquids with strange names and stranger colors. Another, various sheets of paper written in indecipherable handwriting scattered across the table, along with an ink pen with its tip blocked. Um. I would like to go look at the liquid. That's that's what the witch wants to do. Okay, yeah. Um, so again, like this, this table covered in these several containers of liquids uh, ranging from different colors of this kind of yellow, sickly green. Um, another that is this dark reddish brown, almost the color of just not quite congealed blood. Um, a few more that of unnatural colors, one that is a bright blue. Uh, uh, and one of these containers seems to be less covered by dust than the others. Hmm. Um, so I would like to investigate a mysterious object. Do I have to say which specific uh, liquid I'm looking at, or um, if you're if you're looking at the, the the glasses, you can just you can just say the general glasses. Okay. You can yeah. Pick one. Yeah. Um. So just I guess the general the general glasses of liquid. Then, um, I would like to know whose item it is. Um. As you um, look through, uh, there are uh, several uh, scattered pages around here as well. Um, this uh, seems to be part of a, an experiment that somebody is working with. Um, and as um, you examine these, uh, you spot like some initials uh, throughout these on the glasses themselves, um, none that you recognize. Um, but as you lift up this container, a um, you kind of feel that sense of somebody watching. Well, that's creepy. Uh, and I get another question, right? Mm -hmm. Um, what memories does this item hold? So as you're deciphering through the notes and piecing it together to, uh, the glasses and the labels, you know, seeing where each, uh, formula had been, uh, Ref, uh, referred to within these pages. Um, these are experimentations that you realize um, as somebody trying to create life. I find this very fascinating. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna I'm gonna stand and just keep like shuffling through until one of my sisters like literally makes us leave because it's uh, magic that I haven't seen before. You mentioned that we felt like someone was watching us. Um, I would like to take stock and ask uh, what horror here is hidden from the bride. Um, so as you're kind of examining these glasses, um, 
for a moment, your eyes kind of see a, a flicker of movement as if there's something passing over these glasses. It's kind of almost a ghostly hand that appears around one of these containers as if to brush it out or to smooth out the label or to pick it up. So uh, there, is, there is something there, not fully visible yet. And so I actually think I'm going to use one of my ring moves. And I am going to shiver from fear. So name the thing you are most afraid will happen, and the groundskeeper will tell you how it's worse than you feared. Keep the ring, or and then I have choices. <laughs> um, Indeed. What are you most afraid of? So I think she's afraid that these experiments had already been successful and that that ch childlike mechanics actually is what's moving around. Uh, okay. <laughs> what is actually worse? is that the experiment was successful, but the experimenter was not. And while you hear that kind of of the porcelain and clockwork creation, almost as if it's moving, you still see that ghostly movement in front of you across from you on the table. There is something alive here. And there is something that is not quite alive or dead. Okay. So there are two things here. It's not just one. So you may hold on to the ring and choose two of the options, or you may pass on the ring and only choose one. Um, I think I'm going to keep it and choose two, because why not? Go big or go home. Um, so I'm going... And I think that since there's two things in the room, do should I pick what the it is for each, or do are you gonna pick? <laughs> oh no, I get I get to pick what the you it is. Okay. <laughs> the uh, I'm gonna have it speaks to you, so I will take a trauma, but it just speaks to me, and then it has the bride in its clutches. Okay. As your your eyes are kind of fixed on that ghostly hand that you swear is there, you know is there, you feel that kind of instinct of danger. Um, you feel a tug on the end of your dress. And you look up, or you look down rather, and you see this porcelain and clockwork child looking up at you, holding onto your leg. And it just said, Mommy? And that is where we're going to take a quick break. <laughs> uh, we will be back in uh, about five minutes. Uh, we have a little break and we'll be right back, everybody.
And we are back. Um, last time we left off, our bride had been exploring a abandoned uh, machinery room. And upon investigating uh, some interesting liquids, uh, she spotted um, not only a ghostly form that seems to be working around her, but also a clockwork child made out of porcelain. And she felt a tug on her dress, and as she looked down, she see she saw that child looking up at her and just saying, Mommy? Oh god, oh god, oh god. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else want to chime in here? <laughs> Anybody else have any feelings about the situation? <laughs> um... I would like to use a face move. My, um, my, the medium face move. I would like to spill my blood to commune with the horrors of the room. Okay, you can do that. Um, I mean, you, you have plenty of blood that is being, that is still <laughs> bleeding out of your finger. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I mark a trauma, and then the groundskeeper will share whisperings about what happened here, and might ask me a question or two. Yes. So, this child, you think, or whatever it is, this construct, um, is clearly the creation of somebody, and now things are kind of piecing together for you, uh, that this was a, um, likely someone who had been experimenting with trying to create life or a child of her own uh working first with these these liquids and then with machinery and i am going to ask you a couple of questions mm -hmm. um let's see hmm. What uh, what memories does this item hold? The the clockwork child, you mean? Um, it's uh, it's a memory of longing of a woman who wanted a child so badly. Um, being driven to desperation when she couldn't have one, um, no matter how hard she tried. So that that's that the memory is that that longing and that desire. I think that comes through. And why did Bluebeard keep this item? to appease his guilt for blaming her. Interesting. Okay. Um, so yes, this, as you now know these things, <laughs> as you commune with the horrors in here. Mm -hmm. This child is still tucking on your dress. And I think I am going to use another one of my ring moves um, and caress the horror. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So... Yeah, when you cross a horror plus uh, roll plus blood. Let's see. I have too many windows open. Oh no. Oh dear. So as you attempt to uh, guide it, you know, perhaps to 
make it gently let go of you. It just seemed to clutch onto you harder. As it looks up um, and just, I mean, why won't you hold me? I have a question. Yes. Um, when the witch used her face move um, and learned all that things, does she share that with all of us or is that info that's exclusive to her? Um, I, I would have shared it. Okay. Uh, I think upon entering this room and like the witch investigating, you know, all the sciencey stuff, the mother was like shaking her head like, ugh, this is more <laughs> of that nonsense she gets up to. But when the witch talked to the robot child, the automaton, and, you know, felt this belonging to be a parent and all of that, her heart just broke. And now, um, I think one of the only things I can do is, I think the, the mother wants to take stock and try and figure out what this place demands of the bride. But she's also, like, she is, like, feeling for this weird automaton creepy-ass child. <laughs> She wants to know what she can do, and she's like agreeing with the animus for cur caressing it. And what can what can we do for you? <laughs> oh, what does it demand of the bride? Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. This room demands of the bride that where it's clearly not complete, this child, although it can move and act like a child, it has still an off-putting sense to it. It is still mechanical, still made out of porcelain. It needs things from you. It needs blood. It, it needs blood? It <laughs> needs flesh. Oh, gosh. It needs to be completed. Uh, can I care for someone? Can I care for this horror? Can I yeah. take my bloody bandage off and wrap it on its finger and be like, <laughs> I don't know, be blood of my blood, dear child. <laughs> like, I don't know. <laughs> oh, you poor sweet thing. You don't, you don't need, you're, you're, you know. You're okay. <laughs> you're okay. <laughs> you're, I, wa I want to say you're good as you are, but... Eh. But here, you know, like... Very reassuring things to hear from your... your <laughs> uh, you're okay. Yeah, I, I want to, like... I want to get down, like, on my, like, on my knees to its level. And... Yeah, sort of like take this bandage off myself and wrap it on its finger. And uh, dear child, I don't know how much I can do for you, but I want you to have this bit of me. And I hope I hope you can I hope you can be better <laughs> with this. <laughs> Okay. Um, I'm sorry if it eats their face now, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's going to need a demonstration of your sincerity. Oof. As even in its still porcelain face, it kind of like tilts its head. As if you know, to gauge whether you're just trying to appease it or if 
you're actually trying to help to ease their <laughs> suffering. Can I do that? Sure, yeah. Um, I think um, since I, I can uh, I think the bride will kind of like bend down and like place a hand on the head of the child and like kiss it on the forehead like a mother would. Yeah. And uh, you feel that kind of there is dust still on this this porcelain, right? This layer of dust, but you kind of wipe away a bit and kiss its forehead. And it's just we'll kind of lean into your touch a bit. And then stand up again. Okay. And we'll start to walk over back to its table. Um, and I am going to propose a truth and leave the room. <laughs> okay. <laughs> propose the truth of this room to me. What and, do you think happened and is it Bluebeard's fault? I don't think it's Bluebeard's fault. Okay. I I think this room is really all about a previous bride. Um, as the witch said earlier, it's it's this this pain and this fear of, of a woman who couldn't have children that went to extreme lengths to try. And I think she tried so hard that she gave all of herself. And that's the other spirit that we feel in the room is actually the mother of this creature protecting it. Um, and so it's it's not really Bluebeard's fault at all. It was this woman being driven by her her own needs to these extreme places. Um, so I guess it's a token of faithfulness. It is indeed. <laughs> okay, and what do you take from this room? Hmm. I think there um, there might be I think I uh, I would take some of the like notes basically to separate the basically to make it so that other people can't use them. Okay. And as you take the notes and you propose this truth, you exit out of the room and back into the hallways. Um, and I'm going to give up the ring and pass it to the mother. Okay. Mother? Uh I'm going to dutifully take the ring, but I want to sort of connect with the animus for a second. And I want to use my face skill, the martyr, to tell her that I think she was very brave in that room. And um, I really appreciate what she did <laughs> for that child, even if it wasn't her normal <laughs> preference of what to do. And on that, you can uh, heal two trauma. And I'll take Unfortunately, it. there you can only have one face move. Oh, I didn't know that. Sorry. Okay, yeah, I'm done. No worries. <laughs> well, I still am very proud of you. And you're <laughs> awesome. still, you can still express those I'm things. Still gonna tell you those it. things. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that about a bit. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Um, yep. And mother, you may describe the key of the next room. <sighs> I, I think all the other keys were like these really like big keys. <laughs> and so I'm like, let's let's go a little, let's go the other way. Maybe we'll find something like gentle. And I look for something sort of like softer to find this sort of like short little stubby ring. And each of the like teeth on the ring, I think looks sort of like a book, like sort of sideways. 
and so it's sort of like um almost like the back of it it's the backbone of like a bookshelf or or something um and it's sort of brown and but it has speckling like rust on it but almost you can't tell whether it's wood or it's metal it's this weird material okay so yes uh you um find the door that this key fits into and as the room beckons you in you step inside and the door closes behind you you are in a library walls are covered in shelves of books varying tones of large sizes or and different colors of bindings and they stretch upwards high with ladders that reach up to help and show the way um Within, uh, you spot uh, a few books uh, that are set on a table with a chair. Uh, a candle had been placed here, lit, um, as well as a, a quill that has uh, been set next to an ink pot. You also uh, see a... Um, handful of uh, almost uh, embroidery tools that are set off onto another desk by another plush velvet chair. It is warm in here. I think the mother breathes a sigh of relief and is like, a library. Nothing bad could possibly happen here. <laughs> and wants to go sit down in the chair <laughs> next to the pile of books. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, you, uh, you head towards uh, this chair and you sit down kind of feeling that relief <laughs> of just something Normal? Normal. That's what's happening here. Uh, there are the books that are on the table next to you. Can I, like, look at the, like, stack of books on the table and see if any of them look interesting? Yeah, so um, all of these books are bound in this kind of rich blue leather. Uh, you're not sure quite how they would have gotten that color. Uh, you've never seen it in dyes before. Um, but as you go, you see the, um, they don't have any uh, titles to them. There's no indication of what books they belong to. Uh, or volumes or whatever else, uh, but just fine gold uh, bindings to them, almost as if, you know, the pages, uh, the side where the pages are is kind of that kind of gold shimmer to it. If you'd like, you can investigate a mysterious object. Yeah, sorry. Um... I was muted. I was gonna say, can I uh, can I investigate like the top book and see um, what memory what memory this item holds? So as you lift up this book, uh, you start to flip through, um, and the writing within it is is handwritten, um, very uh, clean writing. Uh, meant obviously for somebody to read them and as you flip through um it tells um a story of a 
a woman who had come into her husband's new home and details how she um, was exploring the rooms, coming across um, different things like a theater where uh, she had to dance in front of an audience, had to make herself look pretty and entertain how she wandered through the halls and found herself in um, other rooms with unspeakable things. She, you can see that she scratched out other, uh, almost as if she couldn't bear to write down what had happened here. Um, and as she continues, you don't see much more. That's just more of this exploring until you note that she had not stayed. She had said the final words here is that she had decided to leave Bluebeard's home. And yet, this book is here, written by somebody, detailing the memories of her previous bride. So is that what's also odd or uncanny? <laughs> like, um, does this, can I, can I ask what's odd or uncanny about this item? Can I look to see if I can figure out, like, I, I feel like I'm curious about what these, like, horrors she didn't want to talk about were? Like, is there anything to hint at that stuff? Like, I think we're, like, super curious, like, what, what could be, like, what, what other things? <laughs> what other things? But worse than, like, being forced to dance on a stage and ghost people, I don't know. <laughs> um... Okay, so you kind of like are trying to go through uh, and read more. Um, I find it hard to read through the scratchings, but you see a few mentionings of a tea room and uh, the sensation of drowning and yet also embracing it. Uh, other small snippets, but as you as you put down this book and try to search through the other, perhaps same covers, they have others clues. You find another with more stories, perhaps the same or different. You're not sure. A chronicling of a bride like yourself going through a home. And as you kind of pour through and you find this last one, you open it up. And on that same penmanship, it starts to tell a story of a bride who wanders through the home, found herself in a fencing room and had to watch a young boy die, how she wandered, found herself in another room where life had been tried to be, had been attempted to be created. And how this bride found herself now in the library reading a book. Can I throw the book? Can I just like <laughs> launch it? Like, <laughs> I would like to take stock. <laughs> the book goes flying from our hand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think the Anna's is kind of surprised because normally she's the one that throws things. <laughs> <laughs> um. 
What stalks the bride from the shadows? Uh, Something's clearly watching us. <laughs> as you look around as if to um, to figure out what is happening here, um, what is watching you, um, the candle casting, uh, the candles are within this room, casting several shadows. Um, so it's while it is, creates a warm ambience, it's hard to see. But you, as you kind of look down as if to see if there's anything there, you watch as your own shadow starts to peel upwards. I think that's supposed to stay attached to us, sisters. I don't, I don't like this very much. Um. It, it is still attached to you. It's just starting to take on as if it's of a mind of its own to start to oh, that's rise creepy. up. That's creepy. Um. And I think the animus would stand up from the chair and kind of start like shaking her butt, like get it off. <laughs> Yeah, you start shaking your foot, uh, but the shadow, as all shadows are, is quite attached to you. Um, side note, sisters, is anyone feeling decidedly not so special? I mean, he came, he romanced us, but like, how many other women have there been? Just a thought. Um, can I please use my medium face move to um, spill my blood and maybe talk to our creepy shadow? Yeah. So Excellent. You might, you might mark another trauma. <laughs> another trauma. Good times. You can commune with the horror. Okay. Hmm. So as you are now face to face with your own shadow, as it stands across from you and mirrors your movements, even the shaking of the leg, it tilts its head and you can hear that kind of a voice that sounds like your own. Not quite so. It doesn't sound like your sister's and it doesn't there's a emptiness to it. As it says Or as you kind of hear um if this you're realizing as you're looking at this, this is not naturally a shadow. This is not what it's always been. Something has happened to it. As you have come into this place, perhaps this room, perhaps the castle, you're not sure. I'll ask you a couple of questions. Do, 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 do. Hmm. Hmm. This is an interesting one. Uh What memories does this item hold? This shadow that is not quite yours. Belong to somebody else. Um, it's a woman, presumably another bride. Um, yeah, wandering the halls alone. Always alone. Um, she, like, Blue, Bluebeard is never home. And so she's she's just literally always by herself. So it would be like a montage of just this lonely bride. 
And the only way she can find company is by attaching herself and living through yeah. these other brides. Oh, I like that. And, hmm. Why did Bluebeard keep this item? <laughs> He didn't. Uh, he doesn't want it there, but she won't leave. Okay. So as uh, you uh, realize these truths, the shadow gets closer to you. And you hear, all of you hear that voice of your own voice, but not quite. I'm so lonely. Yes. And I caress a horror. <laughs> You sure can. I want to once again, bleeding heart, feel for this horror. <laughs> and you know, reading all these stories, and as the witch pointed out, there have been so many brides, and of her being so lonely, and Bluebeard doesn't even want her here, and still she's here. And I just want <sighs> to say I'm so sorry you're all alone would you like us to sit down with you a while would you like us to stay here with you for a bit are you crazy <laughs> <laughs> she's lonely she just so is the, the mechanical kid and the, the fencing guy <laughs> Maybe, maybe everything here doesn't have to be our enemy. You would say something like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, you can correct the horror uh, to try to sway it from doing what it's going to do. <laughs> <laughs> I assume it's only going to do nice things right now. <laughs> uh-huh. Sorry, so Chris Ahor is roll plus blood, right? Yep. Ooh, I have negative one blood, so this is gonna be good, y'all. Yeah. Oh. I feel like we failed all our rolls so far. <laughs> we definitely haven't gotten any good ones. Oh boy. <laughs> yeah, so you attempt to, you know try to guide it away from approaching you closer you know you want to comfort it but it's getting uncomfortably close to you and you are now almost directly face to face with the things only perhaps a few inches away from this shadowy thing that is your shadow and not And it places a hand upon your face. Oh no. <laughs> it feels longer. like there shouldn't be any substance there. But it's cold. And you hear her say, Perhaps. You will pay attention to me if I was more like you. Okay, I changed my mind. I want to dirty myself with violence. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Go ahead and roll that. I want to get away from it now. I want to... Uh, carnality. <sighs> Hopefully this one's not as bad. Um... Oops. 
Uh, five plus one plus one. Seven. Seven. That is a mixed success. Okay. So with that, um, all right. So would you like to disable silence or mutilate this shadowy creature? I think I'm just trying to disable them. I think I'm just trying to like disengage and get us away now. I love like, okay, I tried being nice. That didn't work. Let's go. And what are you doing to do this? Um, because I think I I think I tried to you know reach out and be kind to them, but instead they seem to start coming to swallow me up. So I think. I mean, we still got that sword, but I don't know what a sword will do against a shadow. Well, you still, you hit, so you will be able to do whatever you like to do in terms of disabling or silencing or whatever else. Oh, I don't think so. I think they're just coming into our, like, in, up in our face and stuff like that. So I think I'm just, like, pushing them, like, crossing myself and pushing them away. Okay. Um, and trying to get us out of there. Yeah, so again, you expect to pass through this thing as a shadow, but you feel yourself come into contact with something more solid as you manage to push this thing back, almost hitting it kind of in the face, or what you imagine its face, which face would be as it stumbles back. However, on a seven to nine, either your vulnerability opens you up to trauma or your carelessness leaves you in a bad spot. Uh, I think I left us I think that the mother blames herself and so she she feels like she made us vulnerable and, and opened herself up to trauma okay okay hmm. yeah so as you, as you stumble back um, trying to get away from this shadow um you bump into uh one of these tables uh the one with the embroidery stuff on it and as you kind of trip backwards uh you land on wood and thread and metal as you feel something jab into your hand um, as the, all of you are going to take one trauma as you lift up and you see that uh, the pair of scissors is now sticking out of your hand. Can, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying, ouch. <laughs> <laughs> Very much ouch. Uh, am I able to like propose a truth and run out of this room? Yeah, you can totally propose a truth. Okay. The item I'm taking is the scissors in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> As like a lessons learned type thing. And another weapon, you know, we have a sword, we have scissors. Um, and I want to propose that um you know bluebeard's a busy guy he's got a lot to do he's got to travel around and it's not his like it's sad and i you know we feel we feel bad for her that she was all alone but also like there's lots to do around here she could entertain herself it's not his fault that she got so upset <laughs> so i'd like to take a token of faithfulness because i don't think this is bluebeard's fault Okay. <laughs> um, before we uh, actually leave the room, I um, witnessing what I witnessed in this room, I'm not convinced uh, that I agree with Mother here. And I want to um, look at the horror slash um, uh, former bride and I want to say to her, uh, you deserved better. And we deserve better. And then I'm going to tell mother that she was wrong as we're like running out the door. It's, it's, 
Okay, so <laughs> Mother, are you gonna be swayed at all? I'm listening to the witch. <laughs> <I'm>... <laughs> um there does seem like a surprising number of lonely people here for like <laughs> being married to someone. Like you're married. You shouldn't be so sad all the time. <laughs> I'm not necessarily like actively trying to dissuade you. From, yeah, no. Like, but more just it, the witch is kind of like, I told you sewing as we play the room. We never should have married this guy. Friggin' dudes. I mean, you like your independence. We can like be alone and do our own shiz, man. <laughs> I miss the woods. Uh, I, I don't know that the mother is swayed to to be disloyal. Um, I mean, I think it's not great. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely agree that like ugh dudes but <laughs> um oh I don't know I think I think I think the mother is still like doesn't blame isn't convinced that like this one's super bluebeard's fault <laughs> Okay. Unless there's something else, you guys. <laughs> so as you take this token of loyalty and exit out, you have three tokens of faithfulness. And as we now stand, you have traveled these dark halls in search of a truth most divisive. Each room provided you with all the evidence you desire to make that one fateful choice. Now you stand before the forbidden final room and you must decide Will you enter the room or will you simply look through the keyhole? This is a group decision. I mean, I think we gotta know the truth, sisters. There's something sketchy here. Yeah, I mean, like, clear, he hasn't, like, like, oh, I feel like a terrible person saying this. I mean, like, all the, all, everything we've seen so far is people bringing this on themselves. Like, I mean, I know he might get mad at us, but it's not going to be that bad. Like, he'll just get mad. <laughs> I just feel like, why is he keeping secrets from us? We have a right to know. Plus, I think it's going to prove that he's up to no good. Do you both want to go into the room after we've seen him do nothing actually wrong? I mean, definitely not. A, I'll admit, sisters, perhaps we could have found a better suitor, <laughs> but. <laughs> uh, I think perhaps he's created a very unkind well atmosphere in which other people get upset and do bad things. But he himself has done no wrong to us, so I want to stay loyal. Ain't no man gonna keep this witch down. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 it's up to you, Animus. You're in the middle. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> She's like, she, like the bride starts to like sweat a little. She's like, oh god. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I look to you guys for to help me make these kinds of decisions. <laughs> um, I think 
I think that that where like like you're right, mother. He, he maybe hasn't made the most cozy environment, but I also feel. <laughs> <laughs> but like we haven't really seen him do anything bad either so it's not like if we go in there it's gonna like end our marriage right like so like we might as well go in like that's why I'm like we might as well go in and see and get the answers that witch is seeking because it's not like something bad is gonna happen <laughs> I mean, like every if he's other... such a good guy, then it shouldn't be a big deal, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, like, if it's his room, maybe it's safer than all these other rooms that seem to be haunted by ex-wives. <laughs> there are so many wives. I feel like if we go in this room, we're going to get an answer about how many wives there were. <laughs> And then we're going to have a talk. <laughs> but the room is, it's the only thing he asked of us. It's the only thing. He gave us free reign of everything. He gave us keys to explore and find answers on our own of this whole house to make our own decisions. But the Who says he has to know? Has <laughs> That's a good point always done the things that nobody expected us to do i mean we 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 you know we weren't supposed to be so athletic we weren't supposed to go and and be pushing ourselves so hard to to have like a job we weren't supposed to uh you know marry some some old guy with a blue beard you know doing what we're not supposed to do is is kind of like a brand for us <laughs> I, when have I, we ever stepped down from a challenge before? <laughs> I think the challenge here is keeping true. And I, I, I just think that we can find answers looking through the keyhole just as well without, without breaking our word. I think that being true means being true to ourselves. And going in the goddamn room. I mean, I have to back her up on this. She literally said, that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's two to one. So, I mean, I'm going to stand out here. <laughs> In your body. I'm that gonna... you share. Yeah. <laughs> you just feel like a person's moved to one corner of her mind. It just yeah. out. <laughs> yeah, you feel, you feel the mother just like turn away and like cast her eyes and like... <laughs> like her rump. <laughs> like... <sighs> All right. Well, I guess because I'm the one who's slightly more decisive than Animus and Mother has gotten out of the way, I am going to put my hand on the key <sighs> and insert it into the door. Yeah. And then you hear the analyst be like, yeah, this is all you, sis. Like, I'm just back, I'm back up. Like, <laughs> okay. And as you open up this final room, you see first darkness. And then the smell of blood hits you that sharp, coppery sm taste smell that you had just felt before when you had tried to heal your own wound. And on every single surface that you can imagine in this stone room, a bride's displayed in horrific fashions. And let's go around. And these are questions for all of you and all of you may chime in at any point. What were the bride's last loving words to Bluebeard before he killed her? Hmm. 
Can you say it again? What were the bride's last loving words to Bluebeard before he killed her? The witch did not have any loving last words, so this one definitely has to go to someone else. Um. I feel like she apologizes to him, saying, like, I'm sorry you're so lonely, too. I love that. Oh, that's so good. What room does the bride's soul reside in? Um, a music room of some kind so that we can dance. Yeah, is there like a ballroom with a piano? There is indeed. What about the way Bluebeard displays the bride's dead body that makes her happy? I think he sets her up in a in a ballerina pose so that she gets to stay dancing forever. How does the bride disguise the horror done to her body? I think kind of going on theme here that you usually think of a, a ballerina in like a tutu but she's actually in like a long tool skirt. So she's got a lot of, she's very covered. And uh, hide the fact that she has no legs anymore because he cut them <laughs> off. I like that. He still dances, but nobody can see. And finally, how does the bride punish future brides for transgressions against Bluebeard? I think this goes for all of you. I think the witch would want to sort of do something that freezes them in place so they can't um, look away or they can't unsee, they can't move. But I think if they start to like interact with like the, if they try to interact with like the piano or something, um, it's hard for them to stop. Like they have to keep yeah. playing. Because they need to, they need to fill the, they need to fill the house with music so that Bluebeard doesn't feel alone. <laughs> And mother? I'm not sure because I, I think maybe uh, they're called by the music of the piano and they're frozen 
in the gaze of the witch. And I think it makes them want to want to dance and want that music, but they can't like they they can't. So it's almost all the more painful that they're they're frozen. And as we see this bride become another horror that haunts Bluebeard's home, that is where this tale of feminine horror ends for today. Yay! <laughs> Oh man, uh, that was an interesting one. I feel like we were so good and so faithful and he still murdered us, what a dick. Like... <laughs> yeah. Um... That definitely didn't go how I was expecting. <laughs> yeah, no, that was, oh, I was, I, I noted in chat, but this is the most similar to the original story, I think, in many ways um looking a lot at the realization is that she's just one of many brides and just being like so what if i'm not maybe i'm not special like what else is he hiding this is being faithful to the end and going into the room so i i thought that was really cool to kind of see see that play out because this was a fairly chill one. <laughs> <laughs> you guys managed to propose truth very early in a room. Yeah. Before shit went down. <laughs> so like, nope, we're out. So I thought that was very, very interesting. And my favorite part of the game is that we get to see different interpretations and different ways that uh, the story goes. Um, so yes, uh, let's, uh, let's go around um, and meet our cast here again. Big thank you to all of them. Uh, guys, if you get a chance to tell us who you are, uh, where we can find you on the internet, uh, your favorite part of today, uh, and you can throw in your chat into link uh, as well. Uh, so let's start off with uh, with Kelly. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kelly, a Kelly Lane on Twitter. Um, I really liked the creepy kid thing. <laughs> I... I really like horror movies and so many of them have creepy kids in them that it just felt very like appropriate for me. And I liked that it's something that I've caught snippets of the other games, but I haven't gotten to watch the full one, but the, it's something that I haven't seen as much of. Um, so I really, I really liked that room and that dynamic because I think it really defined how we looked at Bluebeard a lot. Like I think it, the way that played out really informed at least I think the animus's opinions until the end and it was like creepy and like oh I really like it. um so you can find me on twitter again at a kelly lane um tuesday nights and wednesday nights you can find me on scraticus academy at 10 p.m est tuesday nights playing curse of strahd in our second season with a really funny group it's the funniest game of curse of strahd that ever happened in my opinion <laughs> um and then wednesday nights playing dynamo which is a weave system game which is a new system it's a base it's a tar tarot deck based system which is really neat um highly recommend and then saturday nights on wandering dm i play Occasionally with Kiana in a Go West, which is a Pulp Cthulhu game set in New Mexico territory, and that is getting uh, next next Saturday. We're going to be having a very dramatic and uh, inquisitive poker game, uh, so I'm interested to see how that plays out. That's me. Awesome! Thank you so much for being here. Uh, yay! Uh, let's move over to Jess. Hello, Jess. Hi, I'm Jess. 
Um, oh my gosh, <laughs> that was amazing. I love that so much. I'm so excited I finally got to play. Thank you for running this game. It was absolutely amazing. Your descriptions are incredible. Uh, that was so much fun. I really liked the wedding prep and sisterly bond parts, especially because there ended up only being three of us. And in the sisterly bonds, you have to declare, you know, like someone who's a negative to you and someone who's a positive to you. And there was only three of us, so it could only be each of us. And I thought that was so hilarious. Um, and I had such a fun time disagreeing with myself because I would much more likely personally have wanted to do things that like the witch of the animus were doing. I'm like, yeah, but oh, the mother feels. I'm like, so I have to like, I'm like, I don't want to, I don't want to touch these things. <laughs> but uh, God, try to be nice. But yes, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I am uh, gosh, I'm not playing as many games as you guys yet because I'm not as cool, but I stream a uh, variety of games over on my channel at least three days a week. On Saturdays, I play with Iron and Ice, which Alicia uh, can also tell you about. Um, and on Sundays, I'm in a Critical Role fan podcast called Critical Reroll uh, that we do. And yeah, I absolutely, I, I need to run this game at some point. This is so good. So thank you. Thank you so, so much. That was amazing. Thank you for being here. Uh, yeah, it's definitely awesome to play with you, especially since we both picked up at PAX and was just like, need to play this. So glad that this worked out. Um, yeah, and then of course, last but not least, we have Alicia. <laughs> Hi, I'm Alicia. Um, what I loved about this game, I agree the sisterly bond stuff was super fun. Not just like establishing it the first, but like playing it all the way throughout. Um, I think this was a really interesting group of sisters that sort of ended up together. Um, and I just really liked the interplay there. Um, and I loved the library. I was a big fan in general of how like Bluebeard was evil, but very in a hands-off way, it seems throughout. So um, it let even those of us who were more skeptical sort of justify a faithful approach so that was really fun and i really liked it um and also i get categorized as a man hating feminist a lot so i like leaning into that that was super fun uh <laughs> you can find me on the internet on twitter at alicia Furness, and uh then i am a producer on the iron and ice channel um, I run Queer Questers on Wednesdays, which is a wholesome game of teens and feelings. It's a D&D &D game, um, and all the players are queer identified, so that's a good time. And then uh, every other Saturday, I run Cold Iron. Um, Jess plays in the opposite weeks that I do, um, but it's a Western-inspired game set on a frozen continent, and it's all... Oh, magic key and it's got themes of like progress versus nature and like cool eco-feminist themes and i'm really into it and i love it and then uh i appear as in my opinion everyone's favorite battle bard nika on lost on the great road where i hit things with a club that yells suck it thanks to magic mouse the most underrated DD spell in my opinion uh yeah so that's where you can find me on the internet and uh, this was super fun, and I'm so glad that I got to play with everyone. Awesome. Yes, uh, everyone, please go check out these lovely people on the internet and all the awesome things they do, because they're great people. And I'm very glad that they agreed to come and play with me uh, as I ran them through a horror game, because these are games that require a lot of trust uh, between GMs and players. And uh, I'm very grateful uh, that all of you showed me the trust to go through this. Uh, and delve into some some interesting topics that I haven't been able to do so far, uh, looking into a lot of themes of motherhood and uh, what it means, to what what loneliness drives you to do. Uh, so I really enjoy doing that. Um, but yes, uh, hi everyone. I am Kiana. I was your groundskeeper for today. Uh, you can find me over on Twitter at Kiana. That's the best way to figure out what I'm doing because I'm on the internet playing role playing games almost every day of the week. Um, Yes, yeah, so if you enjoyed these Booby uh, Brides games, I run a bunch of them. I had a few of them uh, happen uh, earlier, uh, well, late last year and earlier this month. 
uh, I am hoping to open up applications once more uh, soon enough so that I can run more of these because I really enjoy doing these tales of feminine and horror. If you enjoy this game, uh, definitely please go support uh, Bluebeard's Bride. Uh, they have uh, a whole bunch of supplements. They have the original book as well as a whole bunch of other supplements like the Book of Rooms, which I used a lot of today, uh, as well as the Book of Mirrors, which just came out recently. Awesome, awesome stuff. Please go support them. They have amazing stuff over on uh, Magpie Games. Uh, yeah, I really enjoy this this one because it was very chill in many, many ways. Uh, it was very, you know, relaxed and there's no, there wasn't a ton of like exceptional horror, but there was enough to kind of put everyone off their game. And I, somebody in chat said that uh, that a Blue Bears alignment is passive evil. And I think that's a, that was a really cool thing to be like, oh yeah, that, that is what he was in this game passive evil that's what yeah it was more about his neglect than his yeah (laughs) anything which is uh something that i thought was really interesting and was a really cool way to explore that um so yeah uh, i i love the way that the sisters played out today and of course the wedding prep is always my favorite part of the game at any given point because at where i build the game from uh it's from the wedding prep uh but yes um also th- big thank you to katie uh for hosting us over here and for running production behind the scenes being in chat and all that stuff she's awesome follow her she does so many cool things so you can find her over on twitter and here on twitch at katie face um yeah and she she does all sorts of fantastic stuff including a honey heist game that's coming up so uh definitely go check that out because honey heist is super different than this and very silly and I forgot to call that out I'm in that one and she said in chat and so yeah I think it's starting next Sunday so it's like a mini because normally Honey Ice is just one game but we're doing like an ongoing mini campaign and I'm so excited so yeah we're gonna be so fun and silly and wacky bears heisting (laughs) bears heisting because that's (laughs) what we need in all of our lives Um, and yeah, I think that's it from all of us. Thank you so much for being here and being a part of this tale. And we will see all of you around on the internet. <laughs>